One of the aspects I personally like the most is that it, it allows us to visualize at the team level different kinds of tests that could apply for our specific context. So not everything applies to absolutely everything. We need to have a critical way of thinking as a team to identify what are the things that best apply to a given context and to be able to adapt it. And one thing is to it's also an opportunity to improve, to incorporate skills in the team. What are the skills that we need to incorporate because of our context? To continue closing this concept, how can we apply this model at the team level? This holistic testing model, it allows us to have conversations as a team on how we are going to approach the testing from the start. It allows us to reflect as a team in our teams in a more general, holistic way, integral way. Even if we're not super thorough, what are the things that we need to consider? Um, how can we announce this um, shared responsibility idea? Because we talk within the team about what are the tools and the resources that we'll use in creating the feature, the system, or the project. And how will we identify explicitly what is outside of the reach of our team? So that's an important aspect of this holistic approach, to identify what is outside of our reach as a team. You see several references, I think may be important or valuable. You'll have the slides available on SlideShare in case you're interested in further analyzing these topics. Thank you so much to the organization. Thank you for your time. Here's my Twitter and email contact. I'll be around if you want to talk. Um, I love to talk about these things. We have a minute if you have any questions. Sam. Hola, hola. Your amazing talk. Understanding that this is a change in mentality. Besides from talking with the testing team, what is the time? At what time should we start this conversation and with whom? The project manager, developers?
Estoy escuchando eso. No. 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 It started and then went down immediately. And all these quality attributes telling us what to test. But just. Already listened to Claudia with a new meto methodology for the testing. I'm, we are determining these attributes. Is testing a guarantee for quality of the product? What do you think? I evaluate the quality of the product. That's a functional perspective to evaluate. And I can guarantee you that a product has a functional quality if I do functional testing. But only if it's executed with the same attributes that I tested. If you change the profile, can you guarantee that it will you that it will function? It will run the same in the app? No. If you change a role in the functionality in terms of the user, the chart, the login, well, it won't be the same. If you go to a restaurant what's important about the a microcredit In testing, we need a perform. We need to capture information, and when we have internet, the device will capture it. So, how are we focusing the tests? So, why should we try this microcredit? So, we need to fail everything and retry all of the features again. The data is corrupted. It's impossible to load. It's not precise or exact. And so there are a whole lot of problems that don't allow us to focus on the strategic aims of the organization. So we need to focus on the tests with perspective and to know as testers what the organization is after. And beyond that, how do we start to communicate that? So we were talking about soft skills before. And yes, indeed, we need soft skills. In the work quality report, have you seen 
the report, please subscribe, microfocus. You input your mail and you'll receive this report. And you'll know what happened on the previous year concerning tests. So these are questions based on operations worldwide. So to identify what is most important or more with a high priority in IT. Are we ready to try blockchain right now with everything that it takes to make a blockchain test? So just take a look at how important it is and look at where the metaverse is now. So all of this is proposed in for cybersecurity objectives. A blockchain needs to be unchangeable and distributed. It needs to be traceable. The blockchain doesn't change. If you change this and you put a different shape, well, I will tell it. I, I can tell. So the same happens in blockchain. All of the users will know that I changed something from one shape to the other, and so that won't work. So with blockchain, it is exactly the same. And we need to consider this when testing in blockchain. There still has been a lot of issues in terms of blockchain. Have you heard about multi-owned accounts? So they are used for make safer transactions. So only if you sign with your private signature, a given transaction or operation will work. That's how in a wallet, um, a multi-signature account works. So what happens if a different user that doesn't have the private signature signs this account? Well, the money will be lost. Uh, the account will be frozen because it's an open code. The user can try to change this and to back up. So all of these things are happening. So the blockchain tests need to test at the functional level everything in the web. And they need to try the APIs, the inputs, outputs uh, of what is being generated in the API, the smart contracts need to be verified, the templates we need to see how the templates are created. And we need to test node by node. So the tests are really, they are continuous. They are endless. There is no boundaries. And we definitely need more tools to test in blockchain. This is a very new world. It's very important that we understand that cybersecurity is becoming more and more important. And the same with performance. If we have a software, we have a performance. And we need to automate in order to uh, be faster. So let me invite you into this new world. It's not loading. No, oh, I think it's it's broken. Okay. 
never mind. So Chihiro's World is a beautiful movie about a girl called Chihiro. It's based on the, the, the journey by the hero of Joseph Campbell. And Chihiro goes from one world into another. So she lives in a super normal world. She goes into a tunnel and ends up in a world filled with unknown things. And a witch tells her, you'll never go back to your world as it was. So that was a trailer I wanted to show you. That may be what happens with the metaverse. So when we need to go into this immersive test and we need to feel how it is to be in the metaverse and to consider the cybersecurity issues, uh, which are higher, it's like 50% more important in the metaverse. And I was talking to someone yesterday and about this immersive testing a few months ago in February. There, there was an issue in the metaverse where a kid was assaulted and her avatar was sexually assaulted in the metaverse. It was very difficult for this kid because she practically felt it in her skin and how is the app um, protecting us in that sense um, um, what about the user who did that is that person tracked down can we stop that person from op from opening a new use from logging in as a, as a new user so how are we protecting the integrity of the people in the metaverse and their security all of this is generating many, many problems. But also in terms of CO2, we are in, te in technology, we add it to around 2% of the CO2 generated worldwide. So even if you don't believe it, performance testing is so important also in understanding how we damage the world in terms of CO2 emissions. You have the papers available or they are in Spanish and English so that we can understand um, sustainability software development and testing performance and their connection and, and, and the relevance in this, in this field. It's important for people to specialize in this in these aspects of software sustainability. So let me ask you again, who are we? A testing process. Thank you so much. Mercedes, thank you so much. So we have a, a few more minutes. Do you have any questions? Anyone wants to ask maybe a question? Good morning, everyone. Um, regarding blockchain in Abstracta, will there be any training on cybersecurity testing? So it's something that we're working on? Yes, definitely. We don't have a specific project in cybersecurity when we go to a client. We consider in Pandas. We rely on Pandas. Uh, so that these peers can do the more professional approach in terms of cybersecurity. It's not something that we address particularly at the moment, but we are working on it. I have a link of a template for some tests. If you'd like to check them, is the link I added here. We could add it to the presentation so that it's available to anyone interested.
So it will be available with Claudia's uh, slides and presentation. Any other questions from anyone? Either they didn't understand or they got it all. Diego? I know everyone because I, I, I worked at some point in in abstracta. Mercedes, you said something about automation to gain speed. I think you were talking about repetitive testing. Well, it depends on the level at which we're on. I think that this automation will not necessarily lead to an increase in speed. Could you talk a bit more about that? Well, it depends on how we plan the strategy and for which in, in, in which context. So at the code coding level, at the unitary testing level, developers who automate the unitary tests. I think you are referring to regression and functional testing. A corporation might ask to automate a whole module and they think that they will gain speed. But if the testing cases are not good, the automation won't be good. There could be just an excess of changes in per unit of time. And so if there are if there is an excess of changes, we need to be changing the robot each uh, again and again and again. And also the data needs to be updated. Otherwise, think about the testing principle. If we don't change the data, our work will be uh, useless. Thank you, Mercedes, for your presentation. Thank you all. We'll take a small break upstairs. You'll have some snacks for the coffee break, and you can also personally see Mercedes and Claudia. So see you back at 11.30 for the performance talk. See you then.
Si yo voy a hablar alto, pues... No se mueve. We want to respect our schedule, please, so that So I'm going to give you a presentation. I'm going to introduce them very shortly. While the rest of the audience arrives. Leandro Melendez, I think Mr. Per Senior Performer, everyone knows him. Many years of experience and shared contents. You may know him from many diverse events, conferences, meetings. Also, we have Anisbert from Cuba and the other speakers from Mexico. Anisbert, you live in Canada. So a multi-country panel is such a luxury for you to be here today. Anisbert, she's Cuban, over 15 years working in quality, performing engineer, senior in Pedido Sha or <laughs> she's, she was a co-founder of Andex One and a professor of Ord Engineering University. So an excellent professional plus a teacher. Also Antonio Jimenez, who's done performance testing at all levels of all types, which you will which you will see in, in just a bit when he talks to us. And Jose Wenceslao Wayne is he's an in software engineer with many years of experience. Have great activities in conferences, workshops, networks, uh, programming marathons. And he's a strong promoter of free software. So with the speakers introduced, um, please enjoy this, this panel. And let's start. Okay, so welcome to this panel. In this presentation, uh, there was a, a brief introduction. I have podcast, as you mentioned. I have several years experience in technology and performance. And well, would you like to add anything else? So that's from LinkedIn, but it's not updated. I work in global and level three. And observability, graph model of these kind of products, just because I like it. As Arcadio was saying, I, I've been working on software quality for over 15 years. I specialize in performance engineer. Um, currently in Pedidosa, and as part of reliability engineer team, where we're trying to promote good quality practices to work better. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to share with you today and and transmit the whatever experience we 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 might have accumulated throughout our work. Hi, I'm Antonio Jimenez. I've been working in, in performance for 15 years. We have a blog together with Leandro. And also a, some channels. It's not Jamir. It's performance in... in performance in in Spanish. <laughs> That's a work in progress. 
now that you know everyone a bit better, we were talking about what would be best to talk about in the panel. So performance has, it's been changing. Um, in the past 10, 15 years, there have been so many changes in technology. So how should it be done in from now onwards? So the interaction with the software has changed a lot. There are so many things that continue to uh, be created and that we need to face in terms of performance quality for our softwares. So we decided to share our specific experiences. What are the details, the elements that we notice that have been changing lately? What evolutions or changes are no longer applied? So please, when? Tell us about your perspective in the first place. So I'm going to talk about tools. We used to have many tools with paid, <laughs> paid tools with licenses. An ancient concept almost. Today, you get whatever you want. We have devices, we have cell phones, and there are many tools that have not been developed yet. When we started using virtual helmets, well, we need a performance for that. We need tools to test that. It's a different technology. So before, there were different sources for tools and restrained, limited tools. So you need to use whatever you need to use for a given context. Just don't marry into one tool in particular. Let's know how it should work from now on. So in my team, I let them choose whatever they want to use in order to acquire, you know, to, to accomplish um, a goal. And it was, a, it was a scandal initially. So until we started to understand that we don't have to marry into a tool, when, let me note that there were very few, there used to be before, very few tools and paid, but not many, only a few of Two or three. In my case, in particular, something that I think has been changing in performance engineering is on which environment will you want to test? So we want to test as closer as we can to our executing. Sometimes we can have an environment that is very painful, but that's not always the case. We don't always have the possibility to have the same architecture, infrastructure, or the economical means because we have changed, we have developed, and it, it needs to be something effective, but also cost effective. So in Pedidosa, when they asked us to translate the performance testing into execution, we started working obsessively on this. So <laughs> we were kidding. I don't want pizzas to arrive at my place. So right now we don't run tests on staging. Our tests are 100% on production and always on the first stages. We want to normalize so that our resilience methods are so strong that we can run risks at any time because we have, we rely on our quality. We don't run performance at high peak hours. And we think about how to disseminate given brands in order to make them better known. 
we have our test users. It's a very ambitious project that needs to contemplate a lot of inputs. Whatever you do in testing, you cannot and you need to be 100% sure that there won't be any risks in terms of the functioning of the business. We need to give a reliable result that really allows us to confirm what we think and to avoid risks. At the level of management, also, it's a huge um, commitment that needs to be considered. Also, I think that everyone here heard, well, production is something we cannot touch. We cannot mess with the production. So let me tell you that this paradigm is changing today. So final configurations. We don't need to change this without a specific aim. But the mindset is changing. Production is not the only thing that we care about now. We have to consider the cloud. We have to consider reachability. So let's test with users. Let's change our mindset. There are many new things that can be done and are starting to be done, not only in performance, in terms of features, AV, green, blue. There are N that we can start implementing to improve our quality tests. Up until 10, 15 years ago, as Wen was, was telling us before, I say rocket launching, we needed to prepare so much variables, the database, validate the environment, validate sometimes work on weekends, um, during the night, all of these variables needed to be taken into account just for one single test. So it was so hard to control and many things could go wrong. So it wasn't always valuable. It, all, it didn't always provide value. Today, testing is continuous. It's constant. This gives us an idea that is way more current and real about how our system is behaving. We don't need to design all of these controlled events and that, that allows us to be more agile and to have the stakeholders uh, updated at all times on the performance of the product. So the analogy with the rocket space is very popular. If you have I remember a huge project we used to work with and we had only one window before the project started to test it. This was the only opportunity. So the performance testing needed to be perfectly designed in order for it to work. We need to plan with a lot of preparation to consider all of the variables. Now the perspective has really changed. It's not a one opportunity test as it used to be. Now testing is continuous. And so it's not on day one that we need to think on quality. It's on day minus one that we need to start thinking on quality and testing. Principles and practices need to be focused on testing performance, testing quality.
considering the changes I've seen lately, one thing I see a lot is that the performance and quality performance responsi responsibilities are increasingly being shared within the team. A product owner who doesn't know how to do a pull request, if the team cannot collaborate, if the automation software is not accessible, if it is not something that all of the people in the team can access, oh no, I'm the master, of not only I can control it. Well, that will limit the whole project. If everyone needs to wait so that only one person will start updating, well, it doesn't work. Responsibility needs to be shared. So it's a limit for performance, but it also induces a change, a, a waste in, in time. And in the product delivered, in its quality. So think about us asking for a menu in a restaurant, so the chef will prepare everything lovely with a beautiful presentation. It will give it to the tester. The tester will give it to the final user. Look, no salt, it's raw. So it's yeah. back. it needs to be, once it had already been made, cooked, presented, it needs to go back into the kitchen and start all over again. So, when we give freedom to the team and we allow the team to work together, these kind of things won't happen anymore. So let's share performance quality and let's induce all of the team members to be responsible and to take this quality into account. It's not the tester's problem, it's everybody's problem. The testers, testers versus developers is just, it's so unhelpful. We need to bring down those barriers. Another thing that also has changed is the results issue in reports. I think it was already mentioned before on the quality panel. Let me ask you, when we go to the doctor and we have analysis, so what do we expect? If we have a blood test and we have a thousand values, what do I want? I just want to know if I'm okay. So the results before, when we did a performance testing, we delivered a report, a thousand page deep report just to say if something was okay or not. And so nowadays it's only metrics. So if all of the team is involved, managers, senior managers, developers, testers, we all want to know the same thing. So if we share this information, we will have we won't have to face anyone. Rather, we'll have allies because each of us within the corporation has a specific interest in this performance test. So we can all understand the report in terms of what we are interested based on our role, and we will be able to interact and help each other to achieve our goals. The metrics will allow us to understand if okay. as it should or not. I like to compare this with a car where we have a dashboard. We can see how it's working, if it needs a, an oil change. We don't need to be 
to work with cars, to be experts, in order to understand the dashboard. We don't need to work with cars to see that we need gas. Actually, modern cars can even notify parents about the driving of their kids. I mean, things have changed just so much. So these kind of principles in performance is so important. Just share the information and share responsibility with the whole team. So that they can see what's going on, so that they become invested. And... And the project development, including the quality testing, is not limited. Another good practice that we used to think was uh, was mad, but today is very popular, is a resilience resilient uh, testing, where we try to break something down in order to fix it. How, can our, how much will a service take if X and X happens? So for that specific case, we go into a negative uh, scenario to see how the system would respond in a given specific negative context. How do we adjust timeouts and responses? How many retries I, can I assume to continue in the flux and not see the you know the service interrupted? And so that the business is not damaged. So we do, and nowadays, we generate chaos and we imagine this, this perspective. Something that happened uh, was, a, was a crazy scenario a few years ago. That's also how performance testing has changed so much. It allows us to predict negative things and to respond accordingly. So while Anne is very stuck about chaos in the context of performance, there are many things related to infrastructure operations when it comes to chaos and performance. Sometimes I think that it's important to change the hat. If you're an SRE. I need to deal with chaos, I need to lay, deal with automation. Yes, indeed, you need to jump from ro one role to the other. You have to bring down obstacles. We should all be thinking about the big picture of, of solutions. So about what Wen was saying before in terms of results, I definitely remember the results before they used to be presented as a huge report, very hard to read. Very few people were able to understand these reports. Um, there was sometimes an executive report for senior management, but it, they were very way too long documents. Today, results are presented in a way more friendly way. Documents also, it happened something similar. A lot of information, very long, a lot of people just, it was so boring. And with the agile methodologies, the idea is precisely to correct these kind of things. Documentation has evolved into something that is way more useful that you can access on the cloud. It's not an actual document that you have to go into a shared folder 
um, you may not have the access. It's important to make this knowledge, these reports, these documents available to everyone. It's important to understand where I will be working, if it's a, a specific file type, a doc. Documents is everything that that helps the, the team. So it needs to be shared and accessible to all of the team. I wanted to save for last. I want us to understand that performance testing is not the same as load testing. It, it's very important. I know you were all expecting me to to, to make this clarification. Um, is testing back test? Well, no. And currently, there is a continuous change. It's no longer a single rocket that needs to be launched with huge reports. Now it's a continuous process. We need to watch every user, every process, And we may have issues with concurrence or load, but having continuous performance testing, let's stop. Servers, single servers, they are now widely distributed worldwide. So, yeah, I mean, that's an ancient idea. Let's think about the clouds. Change that perspective performance, monitoring, and having the data, being able to see in real time what is happen, happening. I know that if you're not working in performance, it may make you a bit ansh anxious, but essentially you shouldn't have to automate everything in order to work in performance. Many of you told us that you are manual testers or guys, people who works on automation. So how can I do performance? Mr. Performa was saying performance is not load. It's all about capturing information related to performance. So if you do manual tests, She can go into a web and in a very subjective way, identify that a given web page is slow and write it down in a sheet of paper. And she can give this actual value of manual testing to the per to the person who's writing the the report, she can capture it as a tool and make it a continuous test, which is what engineers actually do. So welcome, please get to know the world of performance engineering. <laughs> we no longer think about the. When we monitor, we do evaluate performance. And if we need to understand peak hours and how the business worked and consumption worked, I'm also evaluating performance. So we're more aspirational now. Our resources are devoted to peak tests, to stress tests, to, met to mitigate other risks. You need a lot of developing and automation in the background 
when you're doing performance testing, to have the adequate basis, to have the adequate metrics, and not be afraid of what may be coming in your way because you'll just experience it as you go. It's important to advice with to have advice from people from experts actually to interact with other perspectives with people who are knowledgeable on the area so that we can help each other improve our practices our quality and basically well just to improve continuously. Never stop learning. Don't be afraid of performance. Please keep it in mind. And thank you so much for being here today. So how did you start in this chaos engineering field? How did this change arise within the team? So when we were told that we had to start creating errors in purpose to simulate how the app would respond, it was very challenging. But you get to understand what are the incidents that pose the higher risk. What are these incidents? What are the biggest risks? What can we learn from these errors that we purposefully simulate? And how can I start? And it's been a change. When you generate on purpose this chaos, but we're still working on it, to tell you the truth. Explain a cultural uh, change where we need to think about the benefits of applying a given chaos in a controlled but purposeful way. We're going to lose a lot less than if it happens spontaneously. So it's a prophylactic measure, really. If you get prepared before being wounded, it will hurt less. And, and this is a way in which you can convince your team or your managers or your senior management in order to try this chaos engineering. That's all our speakers today.
speaker is Nicolas Paez. He has a lot of experience. He's an engineer, graduated from the University of Buenos Aires. He's got over 20 years experience in development, software development. But he also teaches and researches He's even specialized in uh, IT and teaching. He's written books and papers on software development. So please take, take enjoy Nicolas' um, talk. Hello, everyone. Um, I, I, I is title testing 3.0. Um, I'm from Argentina and we're very stressed right now. It's not only being here today with you today, but please understand that also we have the, um, a very important soccer match this afternoon. So I might be a bit stressed out. So let's start. This is the presentation I shared with Fede before. You might have, have, um, you might have taken a look at it. So let me tell you a bit about what we're going to talk today in terms of terminology. There are some issues regarding state of art of what we know about personal baggage, of the information available of the industry and what it does. And then we have in general terms, mainstream what we do, what we see that the people is doing. So let me exemplify. Code version. From the state of art, it's very clear that we need to have code version. If you work in software development, I'm sure you're within teams who have code versions. Do you do it? Do you have code versions? Let's think that you do. Okay. The state of the art says that we should. Most of the people do this. But it's also quite common that if I have to do a story, I generate a branch, when I end the branch, I mix it with a queue request and ask for authorization. That is mainstream, but that's not state of the art. State of the art says don't generate branches. That's what research and academia and evidence has proved. Don't do it. There's a difference between, a clear difference between mainstream and state of the art. This is important. It may initially contradict some of the topic for today. How will you test in production? Well, that's what state of the art is. There is evidence to tell us that this is the new path and that this will work. But the truth is that most of the people don't apply it because it's difficult, I don't like it, I don't feel like it. There are many situations in our industry where there is an evidence that there is a path I should walk, I should take, and then most of us go elsewhere. So this is something that we need to think about. And I am going to be talking about this throughout the talk. So I have 20 minutes, <laughs> I'm going to go fast. I have like 35 slides. Okay, let's make a, uh, let's, if we go 40 years back, approximately my age, testing was an informal activity in a way, it, it still happens in some contexts. Our requirement gets in, it's coded, someone verifies it manually, um, sort of exploratory testing. 
they obtain a, a result that will depend on the person, on the tester, because it's a very informal and non-specified tester. The same for developers. All of the developers test and do testing. It's not like you test, you code, and then you don't test. You do as a developer, even if it's a very basic um, test, you do it. At some point, everyone did that. Then we realized that this approach had some issues. So at a further time, we get to the formal testing, traditional waterfall testing. It's what you can still see in the descriptions in some books and in, in university, for instance, they tell you that you need to do this. You will start from a functionality specification that the user will make with an analyst that describes the functionality and from this description of functionality, which may be more or less strict in terms of function, the developer will interpret this to make the app and they will need to write test cases. When functionality is completed, the test cases are used to verify, to check functionality. Now, what's interesting is that it doesn't matter who makes the, the, the checking, the verification, because the test cases are already specified. And those are the steps that need to be followed. So the result should be the same independently of who is testing the process. So the, that is what the books say. They've been telling that since the 80s. The industries has it been working like this since the 80s no way today after many many problems today some corporations are working like that but not most of them one of the things that books were already saying on the 80s was that this process didn't happen simultaneously it was more of a sequential process I develop the functionality. When that is over, it's transferred to another area. People who I don't interact with every day, they may be in another office. They test it with the test cases, and then they provide feedback. And we start on a conversation, on a dialogue. This works, this doesn't. Here's a bug. Here it's. And there is a tension with testers because they discover bugs. And so the tester is criticizing your job. It's not your friend. Have you ever felt um, <laughs> it's, it's difficult to become friends with that person who's evaluating your work? So that's, that's the situation. I think that you might have been in these situations sometimes before. Feeling this tension when you needed to report a bug. Or you know the developer and you need to report bugs on him. So what's the next step in the evolution? We start working in a more agile way. Many post-its. What did Agile brought? Well, what did it contribute with? Well, it brought post-its, that's for sure. Formally, it contributed with many things. How many things in the industry did we actually seize? Only three. In the Agile first version, we included, we started including testing in the developers, in the developing team. So rather than do it as a sequential process, the tester gets involved in the daily activities of their developers. So if, if it detects a bug, it won't just report it. it. It will be a different interaction, quicker interaction 
um, so we become friends, developers and testers. We become friends rather than the tester reporting on the developer. This was one of the ideas behind Agile. And it may be successful, but there are other ideas that didn't uh, thrive in this first version. Agile was created during the 90s. In 2001, it started gaining more force or power. And between 2001 and 2010, 2012, we have what some of us called Agile first generation. And then continuous delivery, DevOps and such started gaining more traction. As Claudia mentioned, today the UX is a bit of a continuation on Agile. And so we started thinking, recreating some things from Agile that Agile had proposed, but that no one paid really real attention to. And we started, you know, appreciating those features. So that's when testing Agile as a fact started. So Devox, from my point of view, so <laughs> here we all work in software. We have an idea, a need, a business opportunity, someone thinks about something, the project gains shape, we evaluate benefits, risks, pitfalls, we start working iteratively, iterations are made, verifications are made, we reach production, actual users see this, we need to operate, obtain metrics, and we start to make money. Typically, on the first stage, the business is involved in order to identify the problem and the needs. I comes the developing team. And there used to be a given friction between business and team and the and the development team. Agile really helped in this in the sense with public ideas. So in, in terms of interaction, like they're not as weirdos as we thought they were. So it started, you know, things started flowing better. But then on the next stage, again, In, and, and the bigger a corporation is, the large, the big, the most, corp, the most divisions it will have, and and so there will always appear these tensions of the other teams are weirdos, or they're reporting on me. There will be frictions, as there used to be with testings, with testers, as we said before. So applications incorporation also created. Operations created frictions. And so operations team realized they had to become friends with the business teams. So let's become friends. I mean, the system won't work unless we become friends and we interact with each other. So that's the box, basically. So the whole point of DevOps is to obtain functionalities faster and for the whole process to flow without sacrificing stability and application of the app. We need to change some things in the way we work, but also these new ways of working will need new tools, something that is very evident. I'm sorry, this is out of place. Claudia already used it. And oh, I thought she had spoiled my <laughs> my talk. So I'm not going to go into it in detail, but this is a typical representation. And Jan Gregory proposed that as testers in this DevOps world, we can have an influence on all of this. 
right? So please check Claudia's talk on this morning for more detail on this. But let's think about the importance of iterative um, development. I do a first iteration. I'm going to work on 10 items. I finish the iteration. Second, second iteration, another 10 items. I iterate throughout this 10 items, but I need to consider the first 10. So I keep adding my storyline on our third iteration. Again, I need to test my third iteration, what I did on my second iteration, what I did on my first iteration. So if I'm going to do this manually, it will be absolutely unsustainable. With each consecutive step, it becomes harder to test. So I have two options. Either I automate or, I mean, I'm a believer. And we start praying. <laughs> I don't know if you believe in God, but I don't think this will work. My thought is some automation tools in order to solve this issue. So Devox really uh, put on the table. One of the things that the Agile manifest, not in the Scrum, but in the EXP version, um, made us realize is that we need to automate tests. Who automated between 2000 and 2005? Almost no one. Today with Devox, we start realizing, discovering that we absolutely need to automate tests. Again, the difference between mainstream and state-of-the-art. State-of-the-art knows this for a long time. If we really consider the agile testing proposal, it's based on four pillars beyond post-its. Testing is not only the work of testers. Developers need to test and they do automated unitary tests as a minimum. Uh, any developers in the room? Mm, only a few. We need to test. Do you agree? Unitary tests, we need to test. Another thing is the early testing. I do the whole iteration. I finish all of the story. And I ask the tester to finish testing everything on the last minute? No. When the iteration starts, on the second day, I should be rounding up some of the features, functionalities. Um, we need to be in coordination with the tester so that the tester can give us feedback on an early on in the process. I don't work I don't wait for the final part of the iteration to test. I start iterating and I start testing. I don't write the test after having the functionality. I write the test, I sign the test beforehand. It may be specification with examples, I may call it like that or not, but what's important is that I specify how the how it works based on the test. It became popular between developers. All of the developers know it, but none of the developers use it. But it's slowly acquired a higher relevance reaching more people today we can all work with look i should write the unitary test the functional test before i code so that the developer understands how to code right and well of course automation which i already mentioned 10 minutes okay i'm a bit tired but i'm <laughs> great in time wise 
Specification with example, the idea is that I start the functionality with the meeting of the three friends. So that's the people, the, the person who knows how the system needs to work, needs to behave. The developer and tester have a meeting with this person because the, the, the tester and developer need to know what they're going to test. And we're going to do this at the beginning. After this meeting, I will write the user story. It may be a useless sentence, but what is the idea? The useless story comes with a set of test cases, which we call examples, but they're basically test cases. With all of this, we guarantee that we understand functionality. And with that in mind, the developer can start to see, okay, this functionality has eight test cases. Well, it tells me about its complexity. This other functionality has 35 test cases. Okay, this functionality may be too big. Let's break it apart. It's also talking to me about its complexity. So the developer can estimate better that the, the, the complexity of the work, the amount of test cases tells a lot in terms of complexity. So we have this three friend meeting. We understand the functionality, we create test cases, now let's get to work. So when the developer starts to code, it already knows how it will be tested. So what about the tester? The tester will have a lot of work to do also from the beginning. The tester may be working on automation of these cases or maybe adding more cases, maybe interacting in other things with the developer, maybe helping the developer to apply the unitary tests. When the developer finishes, the cases are identified and there shouldn't be so much more uh, back and forth between the developer and the tester. The developer has run uh, unitary tests. The developer knows what the tests are going to be because they run them themselves and they warn the tester that they also need to test them in a different environment. So there is a back and forth that is way more fluid. It's more amicable between the developer and the tester. This is an example of a test case. It's something that may be automated. So is the calcu calculation of commissions for a delivery guy. I'm going to have a meeting with a business um, manager. I need to give him a tool that is user friendly and not Java, right? That they, we can write in Spanish. Everyone can understand it. We write on a notebook. So the developing needs to be addressed differently. From the beginning, we know how it should behave. So the technique, all of these techniques are written here in these books if, if you're ever interested in knowing more. Exemplification by example, behavior during development. But they, they, they all mean these this important concepts, they all mean the same basically. These are the, in my understanding, the most clear books to represent requirements in this way. Um, from the development perspective, how do we expect a developer to work in this context? We have the acceptation test. 
in syntax syntaxis gherkin that's going to guide the developer and the developer in doing a unitary test in order to have an acceptance test you need to run a lot of unitary tests so for this process to be successful if i'm doing tdd the developer is doing the whole process in terms of unit testing and so i do a quick manual test and i ask the tester to check it in their environment and this allows for a lot less back and forth So I was talking before about Agile testing year 2000. It was in the books, nobody was doing it. DevOps arrived and so we started thinking, okay, well, maybe this is something we should do. But DevOps brought a lot of other things beyond testing. We continue to talk about functional testing and as testers, we have a lot more to bring into a team that aims to deliver functionalities. So I was trying to show Freddie Mercury in when, when he's um, coming into a stage that represents the opportunity that is there. The tester with all of this DevOx thing the tester has the grand opportunity to be the rock star to come on stage it's sort of like the the tester has always been like the i don't know like the bass player uh, that has a low profile but it's actually super important because they mark the rhythm you know So also like the like the aide who will help the rock leader change guitars, right? So that's the tester. But the tester today needs to come on stage and become the singer. It has a lot of value to bring into any process uh, but as meta performer senior performer would say before well, well that's true but <laughs> there's still some things that we need to learn so we need more collaborative work we need to sit next to the developer we need to talk to the user we cannot as testers stay in our bubble and just test 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 We, we need to participate in the esti estimatives to um, to state our opinion. We need to say what with feedback. We need to collaborate more. If you're going to try to automate a test, we need to code. There is a whole new opportunity with observability. And we need to understand certain structure and metrics. There are new things to learn in order to come on stage to sing. Well, you need to know how to. We need to work on learning the new skills um, necessary for for this kind of role. So these are some of the traditional skills a tester was supposed, was always supposed to have, but it's very evident from looking at this list, the ability to automate. We have the issue also of pipelines. 
we don't do it manually anymore. We click and the whole process starts. There are many verifications that we can add. It's got to do with quality and not necessarily with functionality testing. In the context of a pipeline, we could start a zoning to check security and other aspects. There is, a, there is room to work on pipelines and on generating new tools that would help us to bring quality from a different perspective other than functional testing. We need to have a more whole vision, right? Lisa Crispin's um, infinite diagram mentions a lot of places where we can improve uh, integral quality. They, they use the term holistic. <laughs> that sounds a bit mystical to me. It doesn't matter. The, the, the term it doesn't matter. The, the yes. term to use these possibilities. Let's incorporate technical skills. Let's work in a more collaborative way. We have a new possibility in terms of observability. To, which is to test in production. When you test in production, you don't stop testing in other contexts, but it will open a whole series of possibilities that we can enter if we have tools that allow us to watch observability. And this may help in two ways. To provide feedback and ideas it, and this has to do with code codification and also with infrastructure. What we code needs to be motivated by business drivers. And, and that's where uh, observability becomes important. And the tester plays an important role in discovering this always if they collaborate with the business. And then also let's watch the metrics the visibility that comes from all of this infrastructure. That is a new role. Typically, the tester just gave their approval and never came on stage. They gave the, the communication to other parties and, and, and testers need to become more involved at all stages. And I think I w I'm, I'm, I'm asking you as testers to actually assume this role. I want testers to change their attitudes, to become more proactive. I, I'd like this to become a main street, mainstream act attitude. I think that the business, the, the industry would improve. Um, well, this is what I wanted to share with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions? I will be here only around, only until three. Remember, I have Argentina soccer match this afternoon. Okay, so about... When you talked about useless processes, what do you mean? Well, that's a pattern, and it, it, it's got to do with the value that user codes has. That's not a specification of the client. If the phrase is the whole aim of the business, I just, I don't know what I have to do. That's like a deformation. It's a simplification that many times it is useless. Okay, so I get together with the user, I write a lot of phrases. 
okay, you can do that, but not you can have all of those stories, but what if you need to code tomorrow? It will be useless. If you are in a planning stage and you need to know what you're going to code in the next two weeks, with it just won't do the trick. You need to write it in a way works. There needs to be acceptance criteria. There needs to be examples. Hey, something more generic for the stories set. That's what I meant, I think, when I said uh, useless. Thank you so much, Nico. Thank you for the invitation and for your attention. We'll have a lunch break. And see you back at 2.15 p.m. See you 2.15 with a super interesting panel on the future of the industry. Till then.
Good afternoon. We're going to start our afternoon session. And we will be talking with a panel on the future of the industry. So let's introduce them quickly. Catherine Nunez. She's been in the human resources area for over 15 years. She's passionate about helping teams and corporations to succeed and have great outcomes while staying kind. Also, Matias Voix, he's a senior vice president of Globant and he le he's the leader for Globant X, incubator of platforms. And he also presides several commissions. Vera Babat, is a clinical psychologist. And together with Mercedes Remedy, they have a they have a podcast about essential skills. Mercedes is a co-founder of Lennox that specializes in teaching English to IT corporations. She has over 15 years experience in the team leadership and content creation. So enjoy this, this panel. Thank you, Arka. Thank you so much for being here for your presentation. Valentina was going to be part of this panel, Tortarolo, but she couldn't join us today. At the end, we'll have a minute to answer questions, so please write down any questions you may have. So please um, ask us questions. At the end, we want we want to hear your questions. So we're going to talk about the future of ticket today, and this is a very vast area. Just to get started, we could discuss aspects of work formats. Pre-pandemics, there were already a lot of people working remotely, people working. Please raise your hand, whoever works 100% um, full-time, face-to-face on your, in your job. What about 100% remote? There may also be people working hybrid. What does this mean for talent attraction, for talent retention, for the functions that happen in an office therapy? So I'm next in line. Well, we were discussing just a minute ago. Is that today we have a lot of things in terms of working remotely very, very present. We are leaning towards a hybrid way of working or 100% remote. To think about going to the office nine to five, I mean, it's very cool. But in many industries, this is still a requirement. But when it comes to IT, to what, what we work on, we're experimenting a, a, a change towards hybrid or even 100% remote work. And that's what people want. Having experienced the benefits of remote work, it seems really odd to go back to a full um, working method. And the hybrid work has the strengths of seeing each other physically while also maintaining the benefits of remote work. Because it is important to generate the that cannot always be substituted.
So it's important to take into consideration what every what each singular person wants and how you feel comfortable working. This will not work the same for everyone. How do I generate those spaces and those ways to work? From human resource and people care, if we're going to work 100% well, how do we maintain the human contact? And what about the others? I think that the role of the others. Well, I think that the others must have a role um, as a meeting point, mostly. So that you take the time in the office to connect with your peers to generate relationships and shared experiences uh, rather than be, you know, having a Zoom. Of the a ver. I think that during the pandemics, all the pandemics, and all the talks, we were focusing on what will happen after the pandemic. So let's... Let's take a moment to think about the speed at which uh, things have changed. We really don't know yet what the perfect work scheme is. We're trying things and, 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 and paying close attention to see how people react to this. Uh, th these trends used to be fixed by, by the office, La the managers, by the corporations. And so the, the, that globalization was not actually real. Um, the industry was limited to the face-to-face -face interactions. And during pandemics, during the pandemic, all of this changed. And the, the, the talent, that is the people, started to demand other things and they started to work in a whole different way. And it empowered people within teams. So, for instance, I personally really enjoy to go to the office. Because, I, because it's quiet, I can collaborate, I can work comfortably. But I understand that we need to be to offer the option that will best suit each person. So has a profile of the persons that we're looking for changed? Have the opportunities to contract with people, with employers from other places changed? Is it more competitive now than before? There may be people here today looking for a job, and these are important issues, definitely. I think that the dimension of the opportunities have changed drastically on both ends, both on the corporation's end, who's looking for employers, and on the employer's end, that's looking for a place to work in. If you want an opportunity, you have way more um, opportunities than before. So I think that opportunities have increased. And that definitely that increases competitivity. Competition. From the perspective of a person looking for a job, we have way more opportunities now than than before. So I, I see that as a huge benefit, even though there's also There are also disadvantages that have come with this change. So what I want to focus on was on the singularity. From both ends, um, we're all looking for it that are personalized for what we want, whether it's the enter the corporation or the or the 
about we're looking to have um, a better fit. People who are in more demanding roles and have the luxury of choosing, they can choose to look for a job that allows them to adapt to what they want, to choose to personalize their experience, whether it's remote, hybrid, or face-to-face. Everyone's everyone's talking about generative artificial intel intelligence these days. And now this allows codes to be reviewed and tested automatically. There's a lot said about without a whole and some group of people that will maybe rest useless after it, but what does this automation mean for the industry? So the in terms of the useless class, how much damage does the technology imply in our IT business in terms of human resources. So what do you actually know about generative artificial intelligence? Read about it, research. So try it, test it. to generate codes, to test it, to explain the process, see how it works. And this is really important. So the idea is to generate more human-like responses. And doing this was super interesting. It'd be interesting to share my results with you because I was I was providing inputs on this artificial intelligence to get an idea of how it works. And I had I had such an interesting dialogue with this in, with this artificial intelligence. You wouldn't believe it. And it I am very positive by by nature. So I think that in face of technological advances, we we may be afraid and think about So if you're a tester and automation becomes a new thing, you may wonder, uh, well, what's my role in the future? Well, we need to change and we need to adjust. We need to do what comes next and continue learning in order to adapt, what are the new opportunities that will be available for me as a tester, for instance? This will change, uh, this will bring a change, undoubtedly, this generative artificial in intelligence. The speed that we need is increasingly more than and the impact was huge in just one week, but which was more impactful than the most popular apps available. 40 million people using it in just one week. It doesn't necessarily mean that there will be less job positions. So when we look at the bar Still. in the World uh, Soccer Cup, did it remove, did it eliminate the judge? No, it didn't. I think that it's not about thinking of rules. It will also bring new opportunities.
So regarding the International Work Forum and the number of jobs that may be destroyed, 85 million job positions that could be at risk because of this. But it also discusses or proposes the creation of 95 million new job positions. So let's take this into consideration when we evaluate this new technology. We need to reflect and we need to be involved in this change. What about people that do not have the opportunity to readapt into new technologies that are part of those 85 million job positions that won't have the opportunity to reinvent themselves? What can we do for them? I mean, that's a tough, that's a tough question, but that's a tough answer, which I don't think we know yet, at least I don't but we definitely need to reflect on that and thinking optimistically about it, uh, considering and knowing that this will bring not destruction, but new opportunities. <laughs> I'm not like the Spotify algorithm. I have a certain delay, I'm sorry. I need some time to review not just talk and talk and talk and act. Uh, we need to reflect. And while we think about what are the skills that we need, the mindset is very specific. It's got to do with the mindset that we were taught as middle-aged um, people. The mindset is the key to be expectant and to be positive about the future. So we need to be excited about life, excited about living. If we are tired, burnout, depressed, um, with a negative perspective of our work, um, well, we won't succeed. We need to avoid this. In the office, when we see our peers, when we generate an environment where it's enjoyable to go to work, well, I'm going to connect with that joy of living and with a desire to build positive things for myself, for the business where I work in, but also for society. So what do you think is the role of the corporations in this readaptation, in this adaptation of people um, when they face new technologies? So many people think that corporations are the new universities of the future. What do you think about that? We've definitely seen a transformation of corporations, particularly in IT. They, they, each time they become better in looking and searching and capturing talent. Not because... Yeah. Quite on the contrary. But... We, I mean, it is a very interesting issue to ask ourselves, is it the role of the corporations to discover talents and to educate and instruct talent? But whatever happens in terms of instruction, in terms of learning, corporations seem to have taken a leading role, and I, I think they will continue to play a very important part in the education of professionals linked to the IT world. Moving forward, things will be increasingly fast, and I think the corporations are already adapting to this.
We have some time yet. The role of companies as trainers has already happened in history. There's a lot of countries, for example, post-war, companies had to have a training role to be able to work. So it's very important to collaborate with academia and with social organisms, the, the state, to be able to think of the solutions our country needs, our country and every country, to think of what we need, what the training that we need. Because we're uh, shaping citizens that have to be able to adapt with flexibility to the world that's coming. So if it's just giving them uh, technical skills to carry out a job, we're um, making the educational experience poorer um, in line with that I was thinking of the importance of companies being able to that companies are places where we develop those skills those skills are trans transferable and in that way we can add value as well to people and to the community because it's not just about adding value for this place we're at. I'm going to leave this place with certain skills that are going to be transferable to other roles. So skills have to be those soft skills. They're not soft, really. Um, it means what we are as human beings. Companies are playing a very important role in this. And companies is the biggest uh, associations in the world. There's, there's a lot of companies in the world, so the impact can be huge. What are those skills? Just to close, you talked about adaptability, English. I think that towards the future, skills, not only for technology roles, we're not just talking about this, Let's think about technology. Technology will be, will go across everything. So when we talk about skills for the future, we mean for professions of the future. So we can think of an economist using data analysis. So technology will transform all professions. Ours, um, more in a more accelerated way, when we talk about AI, this will be transformative. And the ones connected with this will be transformed. There was a panel today where we they talked about the role of the tester and how that could be successful. They're a part of a team of a development process to think about everything as an end-to-end -end process. That's critical. So test, testing, thinking about the customer. Those are the areas in which uh, the human being will be more relevant. I think technology is an enabler not to just to allow us to do more complicated things. For example, LinkedIn it empowered the recruiter. Did it empower the recruiter? The recruiter? The recruiter today is it like a salesperson and a data analyst. And in testing, we talked about telemetry, data. Those are the skills I think are going to be more common in the future. It's interesting. In the panel you were talking about, they also mentioned the example of testing uh, in gaming. And they asked, so to be a good game tester, do you need to be a gamer? Well, yeah, of course. So what happens there? That that previous experience of what you bring, what you have lived, what you like, what you have reflected upon in your life, is, if, is it different from your job? Your life is one, so who you are and what you bring to the job, to the table, is everything. So those skills, we call them life skills. Because when we are living, we are exercising them. 
I was thinking, can you do emp empathetic testing? Uh, thinking about the other person, thinking about what the other person needs, maybe we can. Probably that's where we will be different from machines, and that's where we are going to um, give value for a long time. I used to say forever, but now I want to believe that we'll always do, but I hope that it's for a long time. Okay, we'll close with you. Do you want to add something? No, I just was listening to everyone. You were processing. Yes, I was taking my time. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Let's give a big hand. Now, if you have any questions. What did we talk about? So all questions are answered. You talked about connect about connection. And how do you disconnect when we feel that we need to disconnect from the job? How do you handle that from the company standpoint? What do you think? That's what I would like to know. Good question. Talk about disconnecting. It's about working. The, the fact that you're working remotely, be, you are in different places, you can be in other countries, this kind of work needs to, uh, for us to get, have a very, um, a work ethic and that we have really clear agreements of what is expected and what isn't. Because if we are with people that are going to feel that their jobs is uh, threatened, they're going to feel like uh, they have to be connected 24 hours a day and that will generate a pressure and that starts escalating where at the end what you're generating is an environment of a burnout environment and a self-exploitation environment as well. We talked about Adadi. He talked about self-exploitation. We are, we are going towards that. I will add, um, we talked about talent and that that marks the formats. There's still a factor. I don't think we, sh I don't think we should cave uh, in the belonging area. That goes in hand in hand with the culture you are in, and that's the the fear the companies had. It's not just being tied to remote work. It's how do I manage to keep people connected and within the culture? So the risk of disconnecting is to end up not belonging. So if we're working all the time, what we value about the place is the tribe we belong to. So it's about belonging. When you're disconnected, you don't belong to a tribe. And that just means that your job is just a task and doesn't have a bigger purpose. I was just thinking about what Betty was saying about being explicit. That's very important. Even in, in every uh, environment, when you're going hybrid, when you work there, but especially if you're a hundred percent remote, it's a challenge. This connection is a big challenge. When do I disconnect? When do I have a life? So companies play a very important role there. They have to be very explicit in their ways of working. We have to be very explicit on how we want to work and how do we support people to work in a certain way. And on the other hand, I would like to mention that if you're working at a company that doesn't explicit this, for you to also raise your hand, because as people, we are part of that organization and part of what is being reproduced. So I don't have to just be quiet. I know it depends on, the, on each person's personality, but 
it's important to raise your hand and to talk to someone you're friendly with and, and mention this because we are part of the solution as well. Well, talking about the tribe, you're part of the solution as well. This is not something that has happened before. So we're learning, we're reflecting upon this all the time. What seemed like a great idea in pandemic times, maybe is not, is not such a good idea today. What do you think is the biggest differential in retaining new generations like the Z generation, the centen centennials for companies? Well, I'm not really a centennial, so I wouldn't know. <laughs> it's maybe we can ask centennials. None of us are centennials. I'll go back to what I was saying in the beginning. Uh, there's not going to be a silver bullet that solves all problems and adapts everything to every need. That's very difficult. The format that we have to have is one that allows for flexibility because we all value different things. Some people value remote work. Some people value having an office. When it 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 ha it happens. At the pandemic, when stuff started opening up, people started coming and banging on the office door to say, please, I need to go to the, go to the office. And people, some people were happy. So it, it's about understanding individuals and some people are happy working remotely. Some people value the economical part more. Some people value flexibility, time. But what is going on is that it's, hard to find one format that applies to everyone. It, you have to think about the culture you want to generate in the company. And from that, there's a big spectrum of w where the line will go. What do you prioritize? But be flexible within that. The, the choosing of benefits We thought if we were middle aged, that you're, you won't think in the same way. Oh, you're talking about yourself, right? When you say middle age. Remember to allow that spectrum and for the people to choose their own benefits. You said something in your question. Uh, retention. Something I learned. I didn't know, but I knew it, but I learned it better. Uh, I work, by working with a Plecta Meda, the word the, to retain was what Matthias was talking about. As an organization, we have to do a, propo a proposal. And us as people working also have a proposal and what we want to get out of that place so it's really a decision of both parts if they're if we're comfortable at this place with these people and if this is not the place hey, if you worked for two three years somewhere and you want to leave and your next step is going to be somewhere else that's okay but um, you should leave with the best experience and knowledge and you have to be um, uh, at a higher level to offer something to the place you're going to. It's important to let go as well as a leader. We'll see it everywhere. Sometimes some companies complain that they trained people and other companies stole the employees. Well, you have to realize that maybe you were some, you were doing something wrong. So retention is a, a very important word and it means to uh, make people want to stay. Thank you for your question. Thank you for the panelists. That was great. Thank you for being here. I would ask for another uh, hand of, round of applause. 
Uh, something you want to highlight? We have our sponsors. You have stands. We'll come back at three, so maybe you can go check out the stands. It's interesting. We'll see you at three for another panel. We're going to talk about leadership. So, thank you.
Good afternoon for everyone. Let's keep going with the panels. In this case, we're going to talk about leadership. For that, you can see that Mercedes Remedi will be a host again. She likes the role. For everyone uh, just joining us, she's a co-founder of Endy. Uh, it's a company that it teaches English to companies. And together with Vera, they have a podcast. And it's very good and recommended. And she has more than 15 years of experience leading teams and generating content. Alejandra Viglietti. She started in IT 15 years ago. She has done testing, different roles, area chief. She's our uh, COO at Abstracta. Cecilia Benassi. She's the co-founder of Crawler, one of the sponsors you can see in our stands. She has 20 years of experience in software development and she is passionate about software quality and uh, going with teams to help them agile practices. Ledesma, he's Jolo, as we know him. He has, he has 27 years of experience and he has supported teams to create, uh, because he's been creating teams that are motivated and committed. And he's done this through coaching, training, and it's uh, a pleasure to have him here. Enjoy. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming, for staying. Leadership. It's quite a big title, right? Topic. So we're going to talk about work a little bit. Let's do a definition first, a more general definition. Do you want to start? You look like you like it. Do you want to give us a, a theoretical framework? Tell us. Uh, briefly, what's leadership? Hello? We can look at it from several perspectives. From my perspective, what I've learned in the last few years is that leadership is the ability to, uh, of an individual to be able to influence a system. That system can be anything. That's a really short definition to not bore people. We had like 20 minutes, so that's okay. That's perfect. When do you know you're, you are in front of a leader? How do you know someone is a leader? What are the qualities they have to have? Well, personally, I assess some skills that could be Uh, the person is insightful, uh, assess the situations, identify and communicate, uh, maybe a motivator, uh, a problem solver on that day-to-day -day basis. And that is what gives us a first image that there might be someone who shows a leadership role but there's also we all have so have to identify those skills that need to be worked on so in that sense and in a lot of cases if the other person is interested in working on those skills uh, we can do an agreement with them to generate that career path Ale, what do you think I was thinking that those characteristics, I agree with what you're saying, but they change depending on the environment in which we're at. And that leads that there are some leadership characteristics that are given by the environment and by peer acknowledgement. Sports is not the same. For example, I don't care about sports, for example an assigned role, sometimes that co-worker
if someone uh, is able to get people to go somewhere, that's also leadership, to be able to influence their peers. So you have to pay attention to that. You have to be able to observe and the reaction that the person has on other first people. Is there a profile, a leader profile for the for IT sector, or does it depend on each team? Well, it, it, the, the easy answer is that it depends. Depends on where the group is at. Is it a software company? Is it a system team? Within IT, it depends on the roles, the technologies. There's people that are leaders because they know a lot. They're good technically and they have a, they're not knowledge because of their experience and some people might know a bit less, but they have, they always have the right word and they're not nervous, they don't get nervous when something happens or they get nervous and they don't show it, so they unblock certain things. What I want to say, maybe it's a bit uh, a cliche, but leaders don't have to be the best technically. That's very old school. Um, the the no the knowledge of the team doesn't have to be top, but what by what what I know if I'm the leader, I need to nurture myself and knowledge with what my team might give me, and we need to moderate this and understand what are the skills that everyone brings to the table. That's a, a leadership skill as well. Is being a leader a role? Well. It depends. Good question. Within organizations and teams, sometimes there's roles that are defined. Sometimes there's a leader role defined. I would like to differentiate the leadership role that is given by structure of a company versus leadership. Leadership is certain acts of certain actions you might take in different moments where you execute leadership you influence so it becomes important to think about thinking about connecting with the company the teams it's important to have a purpose because maybe you're influencing um for something that is wrong in terms with the organization. So leadership is uh, what, uh, what it needs to do is to make the vision a reality, how to compose that vision from a higher hierarchy role and in the everyday uh, practices. An important role within any team is that that there's someone that there's um, distributed leadership. I love this. I I don't like to talk about a leader. It it seems to make it a figure that's more important than the rest, and I don't think it's like that. I think that sometimes people that are fly under the radar are more of a leader and start building a community for a certain purpose. Is the leader the one who's going to generate the purpose or is it the organization? Well, there has to be implicit leadership within the organization that defines the purpose, the general purpose. Then there are going to be other objectives related to that purpose. Just adding to what Gabriel was saying, I agree that the organization needs to provide these opportunities. But it's also a duty of the people who are members of the organization to generate from their own perspective skills, methods, and different ways in which to work to read scenarios to generate results and with this in mind we, many times we can delegate as leaders of an organization we need to know how to delegate 
um, in people that we trust, that we trust, who have the same work culture as us, and to let them work freely within their own methods and styles. I do agree that there needs to be at positions of leadership. Each person has different professional aims. We want to reach certain goals. Uh, we, we ask ourselves, where do I want to be five years, 10 years from now? So part of that growth and professional growth that all of us dream of We will do that if the organization enables it. And it needs to be compatible with the organization culture. We were talking just now about the match between the between the culture of the organization and each individual per, individual person. Because if if there is no match, people will look for other possibilities can we have leadership qualities and personal professional growth we can also grow from other places and leadership is not always the best the only aim to succeed today because of the work of the, the way we work we're closer to different ways of leadership. Um, we're working with a team perspective way more than before. Being a leader doesn't mean that we, well, I've reached my goal and now I can rest. And no, it doesn't work like that. And it's important to consider that leaders change within the context of their own lives because I'm not the same person I was five years ago. You evolve and so does your role. So what are the challenges that remote work brings in terms of leadership? Because many things, many interactions occur spontaneously in the common areas in the office. And when you have your team distributed sometimes in different countries even. What do you think are some of the main challenges and do you have any tools to face this? Well, I have many things to say about this. Currently, there is a huge challenge for the companies that didn't have, didn't offer remote positions and had to offer remote work um, because of the pandemics. So the, there need to be a change um, where people started working in a critical condition uh, because they needed to have to establish their offices at home. And it was this was very hard for many people who were forced into remote work. But remote work has been around for many years, but it worked in companies that have that had a set a fixed set of rules, which is something that not, not, not always happened during the pandemics. So it's important to take care of employers of a team. We needed to learn a lot of from the March. It's easier to, to, to set our expectations from the onset. I will need X and Y from you, and you need such and such from me. So it's a matter of defining and setting schedules, work hours. We need to fix and set these agreements. So many of these agreements evolved
in a forced way during the pandemics. Many of these agreements have to do with having a close communication between the team members and the leaders, generating one-on-one -on -one discussions, in order to understand how everyone is feeling in teams that are sometimes working 100% remotely from different locations, there needs to be an early feedback on how people is working, how they feel. How is every member of the, each member of the team experiencing this kind of work? Are they working at home? Do they have an objective in their house? We need to understand all of this to take actions when they're needed. So you said the magic word, feedback. And because precisely related to your question, Mercedes, this applies to all work, whether it's remote or not. It's important to have an actual set of feedback, cycle of feedback. In my experience, the main interested party in feedback is the, the person providing the feedback. This has to be a planned action. Is that the leader, the one that, is it the leader that provides feedback? Well, not, not necessarily. Within a team, there needs to be someone that teaches the other members that there needs to be a feedback. And what will the culture be for providing this feedback? We are all responsible within a team of the relationships that are being established within the team. We are all equally responsible. The leader does not have a high responsibility in this sense. They do have different responsibilities, certainly, but feedback cycles are key. It's not just giving an opinion, it's uh, a feedback cycle is when a necessity arises within a team. And from this necessity, from this need, we can demonstrate certain facts and we present these facts to the person in the context of the team's work. It shouldn't be focused on a personal uh, feedback. This won't generate the effect that we're after. We need to provide feedback. We need to have actual facts that can be demonstrated from both ends. And it needs to end in a requirement. So I will ask the person something based on the feedback cycle. Could you please collaborate in reaching this goal? And if that person agrees, then there will be consequences. If they agree to help, based on the feedback, there will be an agreement. We are both committing to this change. So feedback is not just about giving your opinion, but it's about establishing agreements within the team. What happens when these agreements are broken? So, because the leaders are sometimes perceived as an illuminated person with higher responsibilities. But what happens when the agreements do not go through? This is one of the bigger issues that leaders face today, um, setting boundaries. Leadership has four dimensions in terms of structure, right, of hierarchy. You lead your colleagues.
you also need to interact with senior management. And also I need to lead my own work. That's what you don't realize until you become a leader yourself. I need to have this conversation, which I don't feel like having, but I need to for the sake of the project, for the sake of the business. So it's it's easier when maybe someone else was in charge of that feedback, but when you have to when you realize that there are things to change, to improve, and to recognize it, it's a very hard thing to do. And you need to be able to do that as a leader, including your own work. And how do I continue with the with the work? interactions when a feedback was not successful, when my approach was not appropriate. So it's important to understand these issues on agreements and thinking of feedbacks as agreements. When agreements are broken, how do we deal with that? It used to be easier before when hierarchies, hierarchies were more fixed, right? So I'm in charge, I'm the boss, and you'll do what I say. But that has certainly changed, and leaders today, they need to work around this. Many times people naturally avoid conflict. Because I'm, let's face it, it's not a nice thing to to have a conflict, to have an argument. Within teams, within organizations, we need to identify conflicts, That's differences. And we need to manage conflicts that doesn't escalate as to break down relationships but not be afraid of conflicts because conflicts lead to growth. If we avoid conflict, we're not gonna grow. That's very important. From leadership, there are a lot of things that we can do in this sense. When there is a disagreement in the feedback cycle, when the person replies, I cannot do what you're asking me to do. Many times, there is an implicit kind of damage or break in the relationship. Does it end there? No, it doesn't. It escalates into the corporation, into the business. So we need to solve that conflict. Okay, so you don't agree, make a counter offer. We need to be open to what the other person, the other end has to say. It's not only my input. It's very important to take into consideration this aspect. Cecilia, in terms of being assertive and terms like conflict, when we talk about gender in, in particular, are there any differences in leadership when it comes to gender? Or is it the same to talk about female or male leadership? In my experience, I think there are no differences. It doesn't, gender doesn't matter in this sense, whether we're. I have personally the experience of working with women leaders. And this generates a, a very a specific, a singular environment. 
the the interactions are are different the trust relationships are the that but it, of course it can also lead to more conflicts that we need to solve but on our daily activities it's comfortable it's closer we can talk about we can discuss about what closer perspective we can talk about our professional history or the things that we're experiencing experiencing in the team in my experience i think it's nice to work with women leaders Ale, do you how do you feel about women in leadership roles? Do they need new spaces? Well, the leadership is also determined by the environment. And I mean, I agree, and that is true in any in any context. What's been harder for me is to identify myself with a leadership role because I was used to seeing men in this in these roles. I didn't feel comfortable in these environments. And when women are leading, they are used to assign other kind of roles because you're so kind and the team needs this kind of attitude. I would like you to take care of that. So the approach to 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 leadership is different so what i think is that we also need to provide the possibility to men so that they know that they can adopt different and another kind of leadership they don't need to follow the predetermined leadership that a male is expected to to provide uh, we as women we are expected to behave in a certain way we should grow independent from this from these stereotypes i would like to supplement that I love to read about theories in leadership. And one of the first theories states that in order to execute leadership, you need to be a male uh, because of the characteristics of the male, right? So I, I think I'm, I absolutely disagree with this theory. I think that the theory that I like and, and is situational leadership, which means that you are a leader who adapts to your context. That's what our industry requires today. And I would say in every industry, the need to adapt. This is also greatly dependent on, you, you don't always need to be a coach sometimes your leadership needs to be more from a manager perspective but always with the capacity to adapt if you're more of an extroverted person if you have good communication skills um, we think that you will be a better leader necessarily and that is not true so a leader needs to listen. That's the most important skill that a leader should have, to be a good listener. Many times in we see publicly and in social media that the managers, the role of the manager versus the leader, and the leader is good and the manager is bad. 
that's a stereotype. It's different roles, different situations, different contexts, and they complement, they, they, they supplement each other. It shouldn't be conceived like that. Leadership is a long-term position. So it, it, it's, it's more than a three-meeting aim. It's a long-term interaction. It was a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for answering all my questions. And I would like to also thank our audience for being here December 9. A round of applause for the audience, please. Thank you. Do we have any do we have any questions? So this is a question for Gabriel. Gabriel, when you said feedback needs to be oriented towards the relationship rather than the person, I had heard it before, but I, I'm thinking about the leadership definition you said earlier about the influence of the person, which sounds like influence in sort of like a negative way. How do you mean that it, what did you mean by that? Because I want to cultivate that trust with the interaction, but why not with the actual person in particular? Okay, firstly, um, evidently the discussion will be between two persons, but the aim should be the framework of the relationship because the objective is the, is the feedback that we're doing, working on together. We need to focus on the observations that you noticed based on your needs and to have a dialogue, which sometimes is easy and sometimes not so much. Thank you so much for your for your ideas. I had the pleasure of working with Ali. What do you think in terms of leadership and skills that a leader should have? Do you think that anyone who wants to be a leader can be a leader? Or are there people who are just not suited for the job? Well, we need to think about flexibility. If you're very rigid, um, it will be very hard to be a leader. You need to be open to other people thinking differently from you. To be a leader, probably you had a leader before working with you, so you understand the role. That's maybe why you are interested in trying this role. I think that being curious uh, is something that is already enables you to aspire to be a leader. I think that also it's important that people who are interested in this kind of roles and get there, understand that trying the leading role doesn't mean you are stuck there forever. It might not be a good match for you. But definitely you will need to be very, very, you will need to want to work and interact with other people. That myth that in IT, we're all at night working at computers alone. That's just that, a myth.
I think that we can take many things from life to apply in this line of business. If you want to be a leader, you need to be able to accept what you do right and what you do wrong. And you need to see the path that you want to, to follow and be willing to work with others. And let's start with oneself. You will need to show your vulnerability. That's not a disqualifying skill. On the contrary, as a leader, you need to be able to show your own vulnerability. And you will generate the desire to help you within the team. And that's what makes a team successful. To influence on someone, it's, it's, it's very different to manipulating someone, right? Let's not confuse influen influencing on someone and manipulating someone. To influence on someone is to generate motivation. That's what we're looking to as leaders. We want to do this, not manipulate. If I manipulate, I'm going to use your, your, your feelings exclusively for my own ben benefit. I'm not influencing, I'm, I'm manipulating. Thank you so much. And now we're on to Blanca Moreno.
a beginning date, um, deadline, sprints. We're going to have a budget, resources that will be assigned, and what are we building? That is what will define the project we want to build. Not only software, but whatever we want to build, those are the variables we need to build our project. When we are building our project, we can categorize projects and results in three. Our project, maybe it went well, it was done in time, it was adjusted to budget, and everyone did what they had to do. That's a successful project. No one suffered, we're all good, no one quit. When a challenging project means, yes, we did it, but maybe our reputation is a bit damaged, we're not that nice, we're a bit, um, there's a bit of problem with the team, it was challenging, but we got over it and failed. It means that the company tanked, the project tanked, the customer maybe sued us, didn't want to pay. So we have three possible outcomes depending on how we organize projects. According to VitalityChicago.com, you can see a report. Depending on how we want to achieve uh, our project, the work methodology, agile or waterfall, the rate of success based on what they found in thousands of projects, the agile method is 42% are successful. 50% are challenging and 8% failed. And in waterfall methodology, 26% was successful, 53% was challenging, and 21% failed. That doesn't mean that one methodology is better than the other. We need to know the situation in which they're working in. And in that report, it says that the projects that are very long have more success rate with the Agile method and the short projects, the difference is not that much because the definition of the project, what it needs, the period was short and the results were reachable, people know what to do. We're going to see those variables that affect the project. So in short projects, there's no perceived difference between the methodologies, but yes, in bigger projects. So for all of us that build software, we need to ask ourselves, what will be the rate of success? And we need to know our methodology and how big the project is. Why are we here? How can we achieve quality? We need to do a lot of testing or not. So forgetting about methodology to say that a project has quality, it, there's six attributes. Maybe it's timeliness, budget. We achieved our goals in some companies. With more maturity, they have metrics and clear targets. They can have that control. Some companies can also look for feedback from customers. Maybe um, a survey, a survey. What do we want to solve? Do we want more quality? Most projects, they're late, the quality is bad, we don't know how, there is a, a feeling that it's bad because they're telling us to hurry up, to stay more hours, so you say you think that you're working too much. Even if I deliver, I don't feel like the customer uh, is happy. So everyone works a lot of hours and there's a lot of defects, a lot of complaints. 
a time goes by in a project, even if it's agile, we were planning uh, for it to be one or two testers, and now we need an army. And we have done surveys. Every time we do this uh, analysis, we ask people, why do you think that this wasn't done in the right way? Why do you think there are so many bugs and defects? We need to justify the answers. Uh, sometimes it's because the person wasn't given documentation, they gave me a little time. Everything is justified of why we failed. But if everything is real, whoever gives us that information, when did that start? When did the problem start? How are we going to improve quality? If we ask companies when they see that there's problems and that they want to make quality better, and they start giving answers as to, they start to, 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 to try to go faster, just bring more testers, we need, to, we need to launch, or we need more documentation, document everything. That is a sensation that we feel, we feel things are wrong, but we don't accept or realize where we made the mistake. And so, the quality decreases. There's a thousand projects that detected that making decisions increases from 20 to 30 percent. How many times have you in projects have you been asked to check something? I'll check it tomorrow. I can't really do it today. I can maybe I can do it tomorrow. Uh, changes on the, to the project. A project manager didn't do it wrong, but people that are in the team take a long time in deciding. They don't uh, resolve uh, questions, and they just. Let's suppose we take the maximum value, 30, 40, and 70%. Projects will take double the time. It was going to be six months, but now it's going to be a year. You've been there, I know. So there are several theories as to why people don't make decisions, and one of them is uncertainty. Just because I, they don't have enough information. But according to this study that they did, they say that in the first four hours you receive information, you already have everything you need to make a decision. Um, if you take two or three days a week, that's your decision. But in the first four hours, you had the information, you already knew what you were going to decide. The rest of the time, you're convincing yourself on your decision, but you already know the answer. That answer sometimes, I don't know. We don't have to do this, someone else has to do it, but it's just, it takes a long time for us to make that decision. Um, resolving uh, doubts. Many times teams are going to be um, composed of people that have a lot of expertise, but if you don't answer their doubts or questions, that's the most important bottleneck there is in every project. Those are the values they give, but that's the, the, the main part. In some projects or companies, they, they say that we should document properly from the beginning so that if someone has a question, doesn't interrupt someone else and can find information. So that would be information of us that are generating the projects. Make sure that everyone has a plan to make decisions. As testers, we know that everything will fail. The question is, why are we not prepared for this? We know it's part of the, the things that bring us problems. So how do I prepare to have a successful project? In the first place, we need to be clear on the size of the project. 
independently from my role as test as testers we need to know I acknowledge the size of the project is it a medium-sized project less than six months it's a small project more than that it's a one-year project so the size of the project tells me the possibilities of or the complexity the owner needs to be highly technical and a member of the team who's taking decisions and doesn't know how to build a software well they won't take the right decisions or or they will take a long time and so we'll have all of these issues that we discussed before that the project will need to be changed because the person lacked the knowledge a leader needs to build the project so we need to know the process and the way in which we're going to work and there are other three aspects all of the other people involved if they don't have their responsibilities defined all of us can be a bottleneck we can all take bad decisions no one is free from that We need to be mature in terms of how we deal with the rest of the team. As testers, we are taught about techniques, process, to document, to communicate, to obtain information from another source to know what we're going to test. But let's not forget that we're there to lead, uh, to lead the software. I may have a plan, a planning test, that's not appropriate um, if the planification was not right, if, the, if, if, if it does not add value to the project. We need to be very clear on what it means to lead the delivery of the product. What does the client want? What does the client not need? What are the needs of the client? Because my, my planning method needs to be adjusted to this. So emotionally, how do I talk with others? What you're doing is not working. You're, this is a mistake. How do we document? How do we interact with the other members? We sometimes duplicate testing that do not add any value to hey, I want to leave early, I don't care. And the tests. I don't need so much testing. I need to change the way in which I work when I'm trying to reach a decision. I have a period of time. Let's assume it's 24 hours. Four hours in, I could take the decision already, but I extended it all the way to 24 hours. So what happens? I lose my reaction capacity we need to decide faster it doesn't matter if you're wrong we need to decide faster in order to be able to react if something happens so if if we don't do this we will not have the time to react and we are taking a huge risk the testing plan the resources all of that is of course very important um, if we need to do testing, we will need to do the tests required. But the time in which we do these tests from the analysis, planning, performance, execution, it needs to take into consideration the, the time that my decisions will take. How much are we helping others on how, how much are others needing from my time? To prepare a project is a lot more than just designing and executing tests. If I don't know the project, if I don't know the tools, if I don't have the adequate tools, the developer, if they don't understand the risks ahead or the analyst is not able to provide the client with the information to have the full stories, 
all of the projects will fail. Because the work will not be able to be completed on time. There will be no time to see the use, uh, the using cases, the application cases. I'm, I'm missing a slide. What do we not want in a project? We don't want to say that we're delayed. But if we are delayed, it's not because of someone else's fault. He didn't pass it. She didn't pass it on to me. No. I should have foreseen that, all of the aspects regarding time. Sometimes corporations say, okay, let's bring in more testers. No, that's not the solution necessarily. Let's see what the root cause is. Why is this taking so long? So this is what I wanted to talk to you about. If you have any feedback, inputs, or maybe challenges on your own projects, uh, I'll be happy to hear them. Okay, let's let us. Thank you, Lanka. We're talking about a cultural change. Uh, bit by bit, the team members need to incorporate this, this change. Blanca, I also agree with Arcadio. This is a cultural change. In your experience, how do you transfer the possibility to incorporate this cultural change and how is it accepted by the receiving end, right? And by the business. Well, it, it's not easy. That's the truth to change this cultural way of working. It's not easy because we we are used to doing things in a certain way. So why do we need to add steps, for instance, right? So when we help um, and coach businesses, we make them actually see how the persons are working, how they take decisions, how they collaborate within the teams, and what the role of businesses business is. Of if you tell someone to do something different, but their direct boss doesn't support them, then the, all of the work will be futile. It is very important that all of the changes Cultural changes have the are backed by the whole management, by the engineering team, by all of the people involved. So the first thing we do is an evaluation to understand what are the pitfalls that need to be addressed. People who take bad decision, many times they have a hard time accepting it. They, they go like, that's not true. So we start from there, from the field. Let's try to get people to read their own work, analyze it with a critical mindset. The attitude should not be, I'm going to blame someone. I take prophylactic deci decisions rather than reactions. So I start from small things. And I too arrive, arrive on a I will not obtain new knowledge if I don't ask. And this is very important for meetings when we have an office meeting. If I don't have enough knowledge, it's very highly probable that the other people present also didn't have the, this knowledge. 
And so let's make sure that we have the, all of the needed information before we meet with the people involved. Besides from taking on these personal attitudes and responsibilities, we work um, with generating a policy um, horizontally throughout the corporation. And let's all be clear on the consequences of our decisions. Some people take the wrong decisions because they know there won't be any consequences. When we hire someone and when we question someone, we will ask them, why did you decide to release the software? Well, I'm not sure. So it, did it have an artifact? A hundred? Well, we won't release it. When is it a good time? A good time to release it? Around twenty? Well, it depends on how critical you are. There's a lot of um, not well established rules. What well, doesn't matter if there are grammar mistakes, spelling mistakes. Should it be released or not? How do we set those boundaries? How do we make standards? Well, we create a policy, a guideline. This is not allowed. This is allowed. And so people need to work within the framework of the corporation's policy. There is a consequence for not acting ethically within the quality standards in the guideline. So the, the we're all no one's perfect. There may be days when we cannot uh, reach all of these objectives, but it's important to have a guideline to help us to develop techniques, to help developers, to help analysts. That communication is key. So we've done an exercise with people. Someone explains how to draw something to the others. And uh, the, people the person explaining won't tell them what they're drawing. And at the end, the person who gave the indications is sure that they gave the right instructions. And when the others show their drawing, well, it's absolutely unexpected. It's not what the leader thought that they would end up with. So this person was supposedly giving the right instructions, but evidently every recipient interpreted it in a different way. So that's a very interesting exercise. When we're talking about testers, developers, analysts, is it effectively because it will affect how the delivery of the products. Thank you so much, Blanca. Another round of applauses, please. Thank you so much for your time. Let's take a small break. And I'll see you soon at 4.35 with our last panel on automation. 4.35, see you then.
Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being back. We've been right on schedule up until now, so thank you so much for your help. So to close activity on this room, we have the panel on test automation with the participation of Charlie, as we know him, or Carlos Gauto. He has many years of experience. He's champion of K6. Also, he has a, a streaming channel on automation. And many years of experience, and currently you're working in Mercado Libre. Over here we have Laura Gasho. She works on test automation, performance testing, whatever needs to be done. She's very passionate about her work. She's been working for the past in this industry, and it's a pleasure to have her here today. And for Nara, 10 year experience in software development, more than half as part of our team. And also he's an all terrain employer. He teaches, he participates in workshops. So having introduced the panel, I'm your host today. And let's start with the first question. So we're talking about automation. It's no longer the work in the future, something good to help us make more money, to avoid repeating tests. It's become a requirement for the team to answer the multiple challenges and the agile dynamics that are required today. That has been an incredible change in the past few years. People have understood that to evolve together with test automation is, is, is a basic requirement nowadays. So Charlie, let us know, uh, tell us a bit about what the skills, what skills are needed to use test automation in a profitable way. So I think the People need to know software quality very well as core of their knowledge. That's a key aspect. An engineer who works on test automation will, will watch over the, uh, the tests and they need to understand the main concepts around it. I absolutely agree. The career path of quality engineer it demands people that are able to do several different activities. They need to have a good base of because you're going to be collaborating within a team where the aim is to produce um, quality software and automation may be the key, but also you need to know how to test, you need to know how to develop. You need to know if the product generated is correct or not. I think also it's very important to have excellent collaboration skills. If you're an automator, you need data. You need to know who you're supposed to speak to. You need to understand what you need to automate and give priority to the test cases in an appropriate way and do all of this in a dynamic way. So collaboration is a key aspect to achieve this. Some people may think that automation allows you to interact less. And that's not the case actually. So we need, 
we need to know we need we need to understand the language of coding oriented to objects to coding mm -hmm. We need to, um, in order to be able to exert or hold control over the changes that we make. There's been a radical change in this sense. In terms of automation, it's more than having the basic knowledges. Just recently, Charlie was saying that even if you're an automator, you end up doing so many other things. While I'm on it, let's check the pipeline. Let's create images for this or that. And it is true, if you're part of a team and you're all pushing together towards the same goal, that's the attitude that, uh, that you need to have. What was the evolution of the role of the team players? It's, it's not enough to know a single specific coding language. You need to take it a step further. You need to be able to set up a pipeline to know the structure. You need to know the application architecture. So the role has evolved and we have had to adapt based on the needs of the teams. So let me ask you another question about challenges. In this evolution, what are the main challenges that automators have in order to achieve uh, the current goals? Based on the exp my experience, We try to develop strategies to have a return of the inversion, uh, of the capital inversion in terms of test automation. Um, so the challenge is to share this approach with all of the team that they assume responsibility for the project. And not be co confused about that desperation need to have everything automated. We also need to take a little pause to develop and plan. If we have a um, huge array of automated tests, but they don't do the job, then what's the point? supplementing that let's think about what generates value for our client if we focus on the tests on the core tests of the business of our client because if we start automating as Laura was saying without having a plan without understanding our interest it will not lead to successful outcomes automating being able to automate something doesn't mean that we need to automate it. We need to understand that automation is great if it's added value, if it generates a positive impact. That's the most important aspect to understand that we shouldn't be automating just for the sake of automating. In terms of challenge, I would say that there is a challenge that has always been a challenge. We need to be very, very clear when we communicate our, our aims and our function as automators. And this is a problem that's always existed for us. We want to release software as fast as we can. And even though there's a lot of information about this, um, we continue to think that automation is the only and best solution. Yes, evidently it helps. 
but how much it's not always necessarily our best option because i work in the services and hospitality I, it may be that i think about the value the added value to the client especially right i may i i have a high focus on this but i think that we all should think about this what is the value for the client if i automate a specific with a specific aim so in terms of giving providing added value and a, at a faster pace how do we translate the good quality practices to automation what do you think are the best practices when it comes to test automation so this is a popular phrase but i'm a big fan of context driven so of course there are models uh, based on things that have worked before that's perfectly fine but testing is a intellectually challenging activity it will take trials we clearly need a space to experiment when it comes to testing while not reinventing um, anything. We were discussing earlier that you can use a set of good practices as in any development project, but you need to consider that it's impossible to apply everything that the books say on every single people in the teams because we are people after all and we we, we don't all um respond in the same way not all teams are the same not all teams have the same maturity when it comes to automator teams in terms of technical capabilities, using uh, certain tools, um, design patterns for software. And it's important to educate on these aspects and to guide teams. Maybe it may be the test engineers are behind these quality tests but there needs to be a different guidance and we're talking about design patterns not only in automation but in other aspects as well if the team collaborates in the construction what? Let's not forget that automation is basically software construction. We need to take this into consideration. We need to take all of these good practices when we produce software. There are very simple actions that we can take to have to implement good practices. In our case, a few years ago, we understood we had a lot of different projects, clients, businesses, but we know what we want to achieve, which kind of service we want to deliver. And that is before we, we start a project and we're clear about this. We're going to use this and that tools or such and such 
methodologies, how are we going to prioritize the different elements, what do we analyze, search for, to know the boundaries. And all of this needs to be documented. So part of being a leader is to be very clear on what I expect from automators. Based on that, once the project is started with the teams, we build agreements. We create agreements, sometimes with the development team, and we communicate effectively to really respect this set of good practices. So, Laura, I want to grasp this, this opportunity to ask you another question. How do you think that automation can help accessibility testing? When we talk about accessibility, we, we're we talking about the possibility of any person to use a, a software in any context. There are many laws regulating this. Everyone, we understand today that everyone has the access to the right to access information. There is an area that specifies its own accessibility. The same as in other areas of quality. But when it comes to testing, there's a big load of manual testing. They don't provide a wide coverage, but they can help as a um, support tool. So it's important to know that accessibility is being um, considered increasingly, thankfully. Adding on that, I think the key aspect is that we have a conscience of these accessibility issues. And of course, it generates added value for clients that their application has accessibility options. And we have tools that allow us to automate these tasks when we add a portion of a code that could add maybe a bug or, or an artifact. How do we approach these tools so that we don't have to wait until production and then manual testing? There are controls that can be automated so we can check if our web is accessible or not beforehand. We need to work to have the feedback as soon as possible. If we have an accessibility artifact, this is part of working towards having an actual accessible application. Can we do this in a more continuous way? Speaking of tools and automation tools, how do you see the development of new automation tools forward?
What's your opinion? I think that this is something that has evolved, definitely. There are some tools that work for, that are all-terrain, provide solutions for different testings. They may be free of cost or paid. There's a big diversity and that's a good thing. With the level that stimulates developers to work on adding further features. We could speak a long time about just tools alone, but first we need to understand the problem that we have. No matter how many tools we may have, we need we will need to decide on one. And it will depend on each context. There are many good tools available. But it will depend on the client, on the business, on the project. We need to evaluate if it's an MP, if it needs to be super fast, if you need to have something out on the streets in three months, or if it's a long play, long term project. That's what needs to be considered in order to choose a proper tool. I agree fully. I think it's part of understanding the, the context of the problem and where we're standing at today. If you have a team that's very strong in JavaScript, then you know which kind of tool you will need. But maybe my team is more limited or functional, maybe in terms of costs. I will need a licensed or low code tool. It really resolves an issue, a problem. It allows to focus on the business and not so much on technical issues. And that's absolutely valid. Being a better JavaScript editor, for instance, and using my team's potential to help them to start automating. That could be the entrance to becoming automators because they understood the basis. They understood how to prioritize when it comes to automation, and we provide them with a language to do so. I also agree. Before we start automating, it, it is necessary that we understand the context we're in and the team that we have. What training do we have? What is the learning needed for each tool? Do I have the proper training? For each project, all of these answers will be different. And all of them are important in order to decide the tool that well, we need to use. To close the panel, I will ask each of you to maybe give us final advice or message. What would you say to professionals who want to start in automation world? I think that's something that is key is to um, look for the support of your community. If you're starting or if you have some experience or if you're an absolute expert with solid knowledge, you grow closer to a community, not, not only to learn, but also to help others. 
And this is very important. And I hope that all of us here and people watching us on stream just use your communities. There's a very wide community that speaks Spanish as well as every other language. And we need to take to use our community. I agree that there are a lot of resources, a lot of community. Um, technical issues are very important. But we need to remember that in these times of remote work, we have a bigger than ever necessity to communicate effectively in terms of language, in terms of how we write, of how we collaborate. We may have everything it needs to, we need to become great automators and we forget that if we don't communicate effectively, uh, we won't succeed. So in terms of growing closer to communities, We shouldn't be afraid to say, I'm not sure, let me look into that. Uh, it's important not to be afraid to answer questions. We don't need to know everything. We're going to work together to look for solutions and to create what's best. Thank you so much to our speakers for your time today. We have a few minutes for questions. Okay, so that question has so many um, things to discuss, but in testing, there is a concept that is very known, which is trends in testing. The gap between the different areas needs to be smaller, and that's what will help us achieve success. If I understand how to give priorities, what to automate, and what things need to be covered. Four, in terms of the interest of the stakeholders, of the users, to get feedback from the users, to know that I'm not testing things that are useless. I need to test things that will add value. Before I start automating, it's very important to have a solid base of functional testing. If I don't know how to test my system, I cannot even start thinking about automating. If I automate yeah. chaos, I will reach chaos quicker. If you pay attention to all of these talks, we're talking about observability, testing framework. We've reached a level where we have 5,000 test cases running simultaneously, and we, we don't really know how to process all of this information. We need to be a lot more conscious, have the conversations in order to understand what information should be prioritized. And define what's the best thing to do in that context, in that moment, which Probably in next month, within six months, it will change. This is so dynamic. And that is why communication is absolutely key. I would like to add that we need to work with the development teams so that the apps are 
ready to be automated. I think that is very important. And that will lead to the, um, that will allow autom automation to succeed. If software is built in a way that cannot be automated, that will lead to problems. Is it okay to automate before going to production? The best tester is the final user. Is it good? Is it okay to automate before it reaches production? Do you have experience on this? I would say so, yes. But if we do that, we're on the plane of what is functionally referred to as automation. The user is it what the user actually needed? The business unit may realize that it what we automated is not what is being actually used by the end users. And this is a design issue. So this is another level. What was defined as a priority to be automated was not actually a priority because the, because the user doesn't actually get to that function in the app. If it has no value, we need to move on and find another focus. Yes, and what I think is that the answer is yes. That has a lot to do with the return of the investment. What am I going to do to have a fast feedback, to have my investment, a return of my investment? So is it unitary testing, service testing? How am I going to test my service? Will I have an analytic approach? Um, what what levels will I test? But once I do that, will I stop testing? No. I'm going to continue testing. And it's very important to collect the user feedback, to have tools to allow us to um, collect a feedback, what is known as a feedback loop. Final question. For the automator or the general team? For the automator, when you have a test case to automate, have you understood it? What are the validations that the flow will need? You need to understand what you're verifying with that test step. And you need to understand the verifications that need to be in place for the test to work. Who will try the new features and the exploratory testing, which is very important. We won't stop needing manual testing for um, automated testing. The tester will need to have a lot of skill to create these test cases to make sure that everything works. OK, so we have our final keynote to close this conference. Thank you so much for being in this room today with us. Please communicate. Um, Ask your questions.